Daniel and I would like to welcome you to the at-home edition of Father's Day with the Bellevue Church of Christ. Today we're going to enjoy a great message from Bryant Hall, who some of you might remember is the brother of Keith Hall, who worked with us at the Juvenile Detention Center as the chaplain many years ago. We're happy you're all here. We hope you enjoy this. Happy Father's Day to everyone. Let's worship.
Well, there have been many hymn writers over the last three or four hundred years, and it's kind of amazing to me how timeless some of those hymns are. You know, a hymn written three or four hundred years ago is still being sung today. And just like scripture is timeless and applies to us today, I think the message behind some of these hymns also applies to us today as well. Well, Charles Wesley is one of the hymn writers from, from many years ago. He wrote over 6,000 hymns during his lifetime. But in 1738, there was one particular hymn, and the inspiration behind that hymn was his conversion to Christ. Well, in the 1980s then, someone took that song and tweaked it a little bit and took the English from 18th century English to 20th century English, but the message still remains the same. We'll get back to Wesley in just a minute. So as we contemplate uh, taking the bread and cup together, we ask this question, what was the motivation of Jesus for coming to this earth to live among men, to be abused, to be scorned, and eventually facing uh, death on the cross? Why did he do that? Well, I think there's several reasons, but back to Charles Wesley and that song that he wrote in 1738 titled, And Can It Be, I think is a good summary. Love for you and love for me. Let's review the words of that song, then we'll sing it together, and then we'll pray over the bread and cup. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? So is it possible that I would benefit or gain from the blood of Jesus? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who scorned his perfect love. Did he die for me? I'm the one that caused his pain. I'm a part of mankind that rejected him when he came. Despite that, he did it for me. Second verse, you left your father's throne above, so free and infinite your grace. Emptied yourself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. You know, if that was you or me that was facing this challenge, uh, we'd have all kinds of emotions, uh, regret, fear, anger, disgust perhaps, but Jesus had no emotion other than love and he came for us as Adam's descendants. Third verse, boldly I come before your throne to claim your mercy immense and free. Not timidly, but boldly we can approach the throne for grace and mercy. No greater love will e'er be known, for oh my God, it found out me. There's never been a greater example of love, and that love found me. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, died for me? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Let's sing together. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused His pain for me who scorned His perfect love amazing love how can it be that you my God would die for me amazing love how can
Father, we thank you so much for the amazing love that you've shown for all of us. We thank you for Jesus laying down his life for all of us. As we eat this bread together, help us to think about that body of Jesus as he walked on the earth, how he was abused and was crucified, how he rose from the grave and walked this earth again after the resurrection for all of us. Bless all of us as we eat together. We pray for Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, uh, again, we thank you for Jesus laying down his life for all of us. We thank you that we can go boldly to you to ask for help with whatever our needs are and that grace and mercy is available to all of us. As we drink this cup together, help us to think about the blood that was shed on that cross and how that blood cleanses sin for all of us. Bless all of us as we take this cup together. We pray through Jesus. Amen. Oh, the day and 
We've got Bryant Hall Sr. with us today, and Bryant has served as a deacon uh, and also as the director of the Youth Outreach Program at the Buena Vista Church of Christ for the last 15 years, and we hope to be able to get together with them again soon in the near, near future. And I uh, want to encourage you once again to send him a note this week, a card in the mail, encouraging him and thanking him for speaking with, for us today. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about Bryant, he is a physical therapist and director at the Star Physical Therapy where he's worked for 15 years. He earned his doctorate degree and also his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. He's a native Nashvilleian and he's got a heart to serve God. He loves to speak and write about leadership along with participating in hobbies like golf and playing basketball. And he's been married to his beautiful wife, Shatra, and is uh, a blessing of, his, of three spirited sons, Bryant Jr., Bryce, and Braylon. We're so thankful for, for him to be able to speak to us this morning. Hello, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I bring you greetings from the Buena Vesta Church of Christ. I am Bryant Hall Sr., one of the deacons here at Buena Vesta. I first want to give all glory and honor to God our Father. I'm so thankful to the members at Bellevue Church for the love and hosp hospitality that you all express towards my family and I whenever we worship with you guys. I hope and pray each of you are in good spirits and each of you are in good health during these interesting times. A lot has changed over the last few months. All of our lives are a little different these days from worship, being virtually done, wearing face masks, social distancing, to economic disaster, to closed schools and businesses, to heightened fears and anxieties. The only thing that hasn't changed is the big God that we serve, and I believe he has a word for us. We're going to be studying from 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 6 through 8. The text reads, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Pray with me, please. Father God, thank you for being all-powerful, ever-present, and all-knowing. We acknowledge our frailties, brokenness, and hopelessness without you. Where we are weak, Father, make us strong. When we face our fears, help us to practice faith. In the midst of our chaos and confusion, Lord, give us the courage and give us clarity. As we study your word today, help us, Father, to understand how much you love us and how valuable your word is in our lives. Thank you for your amazing grace. It's in the sweet name of Jesus that we lift up this prayer, this message, and all of your creation. Amen. We are going to be talking about leaving a lasting legacy. I have three points and three questions for your consideration. I would love for you to write these points and questions down and go back at some point and reflect on them. I mean, really dig deep. Put some time into figuring out what these points and how these questions relate to your life. I think it's interesting how the thought of death gives clarity to life. When we have a family or friend that are in their final days or their passing, it is a great time to reflect on the memories that they have shared with all of our lives. But another important thing that's equally just as important, important is that we understand that that time is also a time for self-examination in our own lives. I've heard so many people say that they don't even want to think about death, but I think we should to clarify how we are living in the present and what legacy we are leaving for our children and our children's children. Let me share just a few thoughts about our text today that will give you a little bit of a climate of how our text is and how it will go. Paul penned the book of 2 Timothy while he was staring death in the face. In our text, he is accepting the fact that he is getting ready to die. He has been arrested under the orders of the Roman Empire and awaiting execution for preaching God's word under the reign of Emperor Nero. 
Throughout the entire book of 2 Timothy, Paul's focus was to warn Timothy, his understudy, to focus on preaching and living the word at any cost. And this is the reason why in chapter 4, the first two verses, Paul gives him five charges as far as how he needs to lead, lead God's church. He says, number one, I want you to preach the word, proclaim with authority and nothing else the word of God. I want you to be instant, take a stand, keep a sense of urgency, grasp every opportunity in season and out of season. He says, reprove, help people to see their own sin, rebuke sharply and severely, hold people accountable, and also exhort, encourage, comfort, help, and when necessary, go ahead and carry people to Christ. This is why Paul was so focused on giving Timothy these five charges, because he understood the human condition of selfishness and how it caused many to turn from God and him and inevitably would have people turn from Timothy as well. The people of this time, unbelievers and alleged believers, were morally confused, which can be seen in verses 3 through 4. Knowing all this, Paul understands that it is time for him to pass the torch. So in verse number six, Paul says, for I am now ready to be offered. Our first point and question here in the A clause of verse number six is if you are going to leave a lasting legacy, just as Paul, you will need a sacrifice to contribute. And this leads us to our second question or our first question as well. If you have a sacrifice to contribute, you also must ask yourself the question, what's in your cup? We spend a lot of time doing a lot of things. What we spend most of our time doing and obsessing over is usually what we are full of. For some, it's work. It's, it may be a hobby like fishing, golfing, or playing tennis. If you know anything about me, you know that I love golf and basketball. Some people love to spend time on their cell phones, computers, or iPads. Others love spending time reading a suspenseful novel, self-help books, or just walking around the block to meditate. Whatever you do, please understand that there is nothing wrong with enjoying various extracurricular activities as these, as long as it doesn't defile the God we serve. But in all that we do, we must make time for God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by divine inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works." This brings us back to our text. Paul said that, for I am now ready to be offered. The word now suggests that Paul had completed an action. Paul had completed the action of being ready to be offered. The phrase ready to be offered is a present indicative middle. The present tense represents a continuous repeated action. And the middle voice represents a volitional choice that we must make and that Paul made. What had Paul continuously chosen to do? The Greek word for offered means to be sacrificed or poured out. You see, Paul made a choice to sacrifice and pour out his life in order to further the legacy of the gospel. I'm here to tell you that the legacy that you are living, your legacy should be directly connected with the legacy of the gospel. But know that we cannot pour out the gospel if the gospel is not in us. Paul was filled with the word of God because he spent countless hours in the face of God. Ever since Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus, he never looked back. He gave his entire existence to God. Paul says, in, says it well in Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. He says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. If we keep reading 
Paul's writing in our text. He says, my time or my season of departure is at hand. The word departure is analusis in the Greek language, which means death. The original language uses, uses this word to describe a ship hoisting its anchor, a tent being pulled up, or an unyoking of an animal from the burden of a plow or a millstone or cart. What does all this mean? Paul is disconnecting himself from the world. He is getting ready to connect to taking the ultimate eternal journey to be with our Father. Paul is readying himself to make the ultimate sacrifice, which is giving his life and his final breath literally to God. So again, I ask you, what's in your cup? To leave a lasting legacy, you will need a sacrifice to contribute. Make your sacrifice and you're pouring out about God's word. This leads us to our next point and question. Once you have, have, once you have a sacrifice to contribute, then you will have a story to communicate. We humans like stories. I don't know about you, but I like watching movies. I like reading books. It's one of the reasons why we love going and doing these different things, because stories move and they touch us. We've heard and read and seen many stories, but my question to you is, what is your testimony? What is your story? In the Greek language, the nouns come first, so verse 7 actually reads this way. It says, the good fight I have fought. The race, I have finished. The faith, I have kept. Paul gives three different images to describe how he lived his life for God. The first image he leaves us with is that of a soldier. Why a soldier, you may ask? He had volunteered his life to serve Christ. He sacrificed all and was completely committed to the mission of glorifying his father and son. He suffered immensely through all the trials, the threats, the scrapes, and the wars launched by the enemies of Christ. So Paul said, I fought a good fight. The word good is kalos in the Greek, and it means character and integral. Paul is saying that his fight was worthy. It was honorable. It was noble and commendable. He put his time into the mission and stuck to the mission of Christ to the very end. The second image he leads us with is that of an athlete. Why an athlete, you may ask? We all are familiar with the Olympics. The Olympian athlete has to control what he or she eats, what they drink, and what they do to their bodies and mind. And so did Paul. He focused on finishing his race and did not run the risk of being distracted by the things of this world. See, I remember back in my early days of high school, I used to run cross country. And the only reason that I ran cross country was for conditioning for basketball. I told you I love basketball. When I first started, I was great at starting all of my meets. I mean, the first 200 to 300 yards. But I would fall way behind the last 4,980 yards. See, I was a great sprinter, but I had to discover how to pace my race. I had to change my perspective to learn the art of running long distances. You may not be running a three mile race, but we are all dealing with this coronavirus crisis. While some may be focusing on fear, you will need to pace yourself and shape your, your perspective to practice faith over fear. Paul said, I have finished my course. The phrase in the Greek indicates that Paul had completed his mission. He had achieved his life goals which was to glorify God the Father and Jesus through his life. The third image he leaves us with is that of a good steward. Why a steward, you may ask? Paul managed and kept the terms of his faith contract with Christ. Paul had plenty of times during his sufferings and trials to abandon his faith. Instead of forsaking his faith, he leaned into his difficult times and deepened his faith in Christ. He planted roots and weathered the storms. Paul says, I have kept the faith. See, it can be easy, quite easy to gain, obtain, possess, and land an opportunity, but it is harder to keep the opportunity. When Paul says, I have kept the faith, he is letting us know that there is something invaluable about the keeping. This word is defined in the Greek language by a person's ability to preserve, maintain, or protect something. 
the story of your life, the story of my life, we will all have our lives highlighted by our ability to keep the faith in the midst of adversity. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When Paul explains, I have kept the faith, the Greek word for faith is pistis, which means joyful trust conjoint with obedience. He is describing how he has managed to stay joyful despite the harsh circumstances he has faced. For this reason, he knows that this is his testimony. During these difficult times from COVID-19, please focus your mind on the keeping. Keep, preserve, maintain, and protect your faith and by setting aside a few minutes every day to pray and study with God Almighty. I find it interesting that in verse 7, each of these verbs, fought, finished, ran, kept, have something in common. Each is a perfect indicative, which means it's an action completed in the past, but it has abiding or continued results. What is your testimony? What story are you communicating with the world? What legacy are you leaving behind for your church family? But better yet, what legacy are you leaving behind for your biological family? When you can be sure of the sacrifice you are contributing and what's in your cup and when you are sold on the story you are communicating and the impact of your testimony, then you will approach life with a sense of certainty. Our final point is a sense of certainty. And my final question to you is, what will be your reward? Paul writes verse 8 with a victorious tone. He speaks about a crown, which is an emblem of victory. He is using language of certainty and confidence. It reminds me of how we started the first chapter in this book. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God did give, hath not given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and of sound mind. As Paul is getting closer and closer to his death, his legacy is being solidified. He isn't shocked. He isn't wishing for the best. He said in verse 8, henceforth, he is bringing his life to a beautiful culmination. He says, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me. Paul's sense of certainty about receiving the victor's crown from the Lord because the Lord is going to judge him by how he sacrificed all of who he is for the gospel's sake and by how he has also been careful to represent Christ through his story. The last clause of verse number eight says, and this is beautiful, he says, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Love in the Greek is agapeo which means to find an absolute and infinite joy. I challenge everyone, just as Paul, to find absolute and infinite joy in the word of God. Paul took great confidence in knowing that him and anyone else that finds absolute and infinite joy in the Lord will one day wear their victor's crown. Let me leave you with this thought. I've never heard anyone Dying with regrets of wanting a better job. Dying with the regrets of wanting a better car. Dying with the regrets of wanting a bigger house. Or dying with the regrets of wanting more money. But the biggest regrets has to do with more significant and impactful priorities such as wanting a better relationship with God, wanting a deeper love with their spouse, or wanting a stronger bond with their children. So I have good news and I have bad news. The bad news is you cannot make up for the time that you've already lost. But the good news is you can start today fiercely loving your Father in heaven and committing to the Word of God. You can start today leaving behind a lasting legacy for your loved ones and all those who you know in order that God will be praised. This is all possible 
only because of the uniqueness and the power that God has created us. See, every day that God gives me with my wife and boys, I want them to know how deeply in love I am with God. And I want them to know that this creates and shapes all other relationships in my life. It allows me to unconditionally love them. This is all because of the father's love. But for me, it is also possible because I had a father that I'm forever indebted to. My father's father left him at the age of seven. But my father did not let that define his legacy. Watching my father's love for God, it inspired me. It stirred me up with a passion, a determination, and a reason for me to foolishly believe God at any cost. Start today, leaving a lasting legacy that leads others to God by staying connected to God's word. It will not always be easy. Matter of fact, it may take many sacrifices. But I will promise you this. With God's love and his amazing grace, you will leave a lasting le legacy that proclaims the power and the glory of God. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for your attention. Not since World War II have I seen a condition which frightened the entire globe. Of course, the unrest of 1968 came close in terms of producing fear, but that was played out most vividly in the United States. For a half year now, we and other citizens have endured unprecedented requirements for behavioral change. For the first time in my life, our leaders for health and safety's sake, have told us, do not assemble. Our pews at Bellevue have fallen empty for months. What am I to do next? Why is this happening? When will it all come to an end? In the aggregate, many of us are overwhelmed almost to the point of being paralyzed, unable to move, to decide, or to act. Those who study human behavior tell us that people who choose to take their own lives make that decision because they see no hope 
no end at all to the mental or physical pain they endure. But God's Word reassures us that there is hope. My favorite Old Testament character is David. Jehovah blessed David more than anyone before him. Yet David committed just about every terrible sin known to mankind. The list is long. I'll truncate it. He took another man's wife. When it was going to be discovered, he tried to cover it up, ending and having his faithful soldier servant Uriah murdered. Psalm 51 chronicles David's contrition and repentance. In 1 Kings 14, God speaks of David in glowing terms. He's talking to Rehoboam about how he's misbehaved and how he's not lived as God would have him to do. And God says, My servant David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only that which was right in my eyes. What? How could this unqualified account of David's life be so proclaimed by the Almighty? Recall, we are told when God forgives our sins, He forgets them. I propose that this scripture in 1 Kings 14 and 8 documents that. Isaiah 1, 18 reminds us, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. These and other biblical reminders reassure me that in the darkest times, there is an eternity for us a seat at the table in the presence of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and all the redeemed. Eternal hospitality. Join me as we pronounce the benediction. Almighty God, creator of the universe, we are so thankful for our lives, for the blessings you bestow upon us, which we cannot even number. We pray for strength as in times of difficulty, and we pray for your watchful care over us. We pray for our leaders, for our elders, our shepherds, for those on staff, and for all of our members that we may reassemble again soon, that we will not faint nor become discouraged in these difficult times. We ask for the forgiveness of our sins, for good hearts, for a peaceful hour in which to pass from this life and eternity with you. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, and amen. Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way, higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Hilltops of glory, I now can see. Oh